Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Laura. <laughs> I, I don't know uh, what else to say about that. Um, but to be honest, when Robin asked me to speak tonight, I was rather hesitant. Um, I tried a few delayed tactics, which was basically like, I'm too tired to think about it today. I'll, I'll tell you tomorrow. I tried that three times, and then Robin was like, hey, it's like two weeks away. I really need an answer. Um, so then he, I was like, well, you know, I haven't like really been in a service for like four and a half months because our daughter's four and a half months old and I'm usually in the back or in a different room because she's crying or hungry or something. And uh, I don't even, Ron was like, what? That, that doesn't make any sense. I was like, well, I'm like out of the loop. I, I, don't, I don't have the vibe of like the room anymore. And <laughs> he just like kind of stared at me blankly. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll, I'm going to try that on someone else. So I talked to Philly. <laughs> Felicia and I was like, yeah, you know, Philly, I just, I don't think, I haven't been in the service in so long, I just, I don't think, she was like, well, Laura, have you prayed about it? And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> it's like, Philly, why, why am I friends with you again? <laughs> I was like, oh, that's why, because you challenge me and you say wise things and you ask me hard questions. And if you don't have a friend like Philly, you should make a friend like Philly because she's wise and um, awesome and just like really a pillar in my life. And so she's also watching Kai for me right now in the baby room. So thank you, Philly. I know you can hear this. Um, and if you can't find a friend like Philly, just make friends with Philly. So anyways, that's my, that's my little praise report for um, Felicia. She's the best. So anyways, here I am speaking to you. And we're actually, um, funnily enough, we're going to be talking about acting on the voice of God. So this whole series um, in Acts has been Acts of Prayer. And we've been looking at how prayer played a role um, in the birth and the growth um, and the lives of the apostles in the early church. Um, and tonight is going to be no exception. Um, tonight we're starting in Acts 9, which is actually right after where Robin left off last week, he was talking about Simon the Sorcerer trying to buy the power of the Holy Spirit off of Peter and John. That obviously didn't go over very well. Um, and then there's another little section where Philip's out preaching and teaching, and then we come to chapter 9. And chapter 9 talks about Saul, and Saul is um, a Pharisee. He's very powerful, and he has a vendetta against the early church, and he's actually out persecuting them and arresting them um, and trying to murder them anyone who says that they follow Jesus. Um, so it's, he's, he's not the nicest person, but we're picking up there and we're picking up in a chapter where he has a life-changing encounter with Jesus. So it's very dramatic, it's very exciting, um, and it's going to actually teach us a lot about listening to and acting on the voice of God. Um, so I'm excited. Let's pray, and then we're going to get into it. So God, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you for this opportunity um, to share your word with our community, and I just thank you for everyone who's here in these seats. I just pray, God, that um, it would be your words um, and not mine being spoken tonight, and that we would just hear your voice and leave here feeling closer to you and equipped to um, share your love and your good news with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, you can open to Acts 9. And as I shared before, we've been in Acts this whole series. And to sort of set the stage, basically what's happening is Peter and John are um, going around discipling early believers. Philip's sort of going ahead of them. He's evangelizing and, con and getting converts. And then Peter and John come and follow him and, and disciple those and, and give them some structure to be able to meet in groups and, and grow in their faith. Um, and so they're out doing that. Um, in the midst of that, there's been um, a couple um, a couple of Jesus followers have been killed for their beliefs um, by the approval of Saul, who I was talking about before. And so this is where we pick up. And the very first verse says, so meanwhile, meanwhile, this is after we've heard all the great things Peter, John, and Philip are doing. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So we know this is going to be a dramatic story. But before we continue, cliffhanger, I want to actually skip to the end. And does anyone love to read in this room? Like, would you consider yourself an avid reader? <laughs> yeah, Jess, Jess is like, yeah, I'm reading this new book this week. And I was like, you were reading a different one last week. She's a really fast reader. <laughs> I'm not like that. But anyways, um, I do love to read. And 
I actually had a friend once who every time they start, they loved, they like read all the day, they were always reading, and every time they started a new book, they would read the first chapter, and then they would skip to the end of the book and read the very last sentence, which is so, like, that seems so bizarre to me, because I'm like, you're going to spoil the whole story. That's like, you, I avoid the back half of the book like the plague if I'm trying not to get spoiled, right? Why would you flip and read the last sentence? But when I read this passage of scripture, the last sentence of this um, section of this story stood out so um, boldly to me that I wanted to read it before we actually read the whole thing. So I'm going to skip down to verse 31, and it'll all make sense in the end, trust me. And so verse 30, we just read, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was either eager to kill the Lord's followers. At the end of the story, verse 31, the church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. Pretty cool. That is the summary to that story after that crazy introduction. So let's read the whole thing. Let's see what happens, and let's see how we can get from murderous threats to peace and increase and strength. So... Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, which um, is just a term for the early church, uh, any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Everyone says, who are you? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. Everybody say, yes, Lord. Yes. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a name from Tarsus, a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, everyone say but Lord, exclaimed Ananias. I have heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. So this is a very fascinating exchange to me. Not only do we have the most, one of the most powerful anti-Christ um, followers, um, being encountering God in a very powerful way, but we also have a believer who in extreme obedience goes to this man who he's rightly sort of terrified of to pray for him for healing. And my question is, how, how, did, that, how did that work? And what I noticed was, and why I got you to read out the sections that you read out, was that there's such intense dialogue between not only... Um, Ananias and God, but God and Saul as well. And so I want to explore that a bit because it can teach us a lot about talking to God and praying to God and how prayer worked in the early church and can work in our lives today. So when I was preparing this sermon, I was reading commentaries and 
I was doing research and I was gonna have all these fun academic facts for you guys about why Saul would recognize certain things about what was happening to him based on ancient things. And, and then I just decided, you know what, I'm, just, I'm actually just gonna talk about the scripture. Um, and, and that's partly because um, I have a baby and the, you know, I thought I'd have this much prep time and it turned into like this much prep time, just to be honest with you guys. So this is called mom style preaching. We're just going to get in, get dirty and then get out. So we're just sticking to the scripture tonight. If you want historical context, you can go Google it. <laughs> so, so what do we notice here? This is going to be really fun Bible study. So what I found was that Jesus spoke to Saul, even though Saul didn't know who he was. Um, Saul, what did Saul say when, when he was knocked to the ground by this bright light and heard his name? He said, who are you, Lord? He had no idea who was speaking to him. And I think that's so cool because um, there are actually other places in the Bible where that happens. In the Old Testament, there's a, a boy slash priest later named Samuel, and when he was a boy, he was being trained up by the high priest, and one night when he was lying in bed, he heard his name, Samuel, Samuel, and the Bible says, but Samuel didn't know the Lord yet, and so he thought it was Eli, his high priest, calling to him, so he got up, ran to Eli's bed, and said, yes, Eli, here I am. Eli wakes up, and he goes, I, what are you doing here? I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This happens three times. Samuel, Samuel, gets up, goes to Eli. Eli, here I am. You called me, and finally, the third time, Eli kind of goes, oh, duh, I'm not this must be the Lord calling you, Samuel. Samuel, go lie down. When you hear your name again, say, yes, Lord, um, your servant is listening. Um, and so it's just very cool to me that consistently in Scripture, God, Jesus, shows up to people who don't know him yet, um, and, and he reveals himself to them. And um, we contrast that with Ananias' response. Ananias knew Jesus um, he was a follower of his. And so what does he say when, when he hears Jesus call his name? Ananias, he says, yes, Lord. Right? He knows right away that it's Jesus speaking to him. And he's willing and able to walk, to, to invite Jesus to speak further into um, his life. And again, in the Old Testament, there are other, other times in the Bible where people who knew Christ answered in the same way. So Abraham, when he's about to sacrifice his son Isaac because he felt that that's what the Lord was asking him to do. He literally has a knife like up and his son is on the altar and he hears his name, Abraham. And he goes, here I am, which is like, I would respond that way too if I was, you know, like good thing he knew God's voice, right? Um, so Abraham does it. Um, Isaiah, the, the prophet, when he's being commissioned, the Lord goes, who am, who am I going to send to go talk to my people? Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Um, those are just a couple examples. And so we see through scripture God sh speaking to these people, whether or not they know him, and them either stopping, because re recognizing that they're being spoken to, but they're not sure by who. So they say, who, who are you, Lord? Or saying, here I am, I'm, I'm ready to listen. Um, and I think that's really important to pick up on. Um, because I think often these days, we overcomplicate what hearing God's voice is. I, I actually think we know the voice of God a lot better than we let ourselves believe. Um, we sort of, you know, we maybe feel encouraged to do something, to speak to someone, to invite someone to church, and, and you clam up and you go, That's, is, that, is God asking me to do something? I don't know. Maybe, um, no, I'm just going to keep going. You know, and, 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 and what this is inviting us to do is, if you're not sure, say, Lord, are you speaking to me? Is that you? Jesus, who are you, Lord? What is this voice speaking to me? And if you know it is, you can say, yes, Lord, what's next? Because that's exactly what both of them do. The crazy thing is, the beautiful thing is, is that Jesus answered both of them, right? He didn't hold judgment against Saul. He didn't hold judgment um, against Samuel, who was just a boy and, and didn't know him. He answered both of them because he was invited to speak into their life. And so when we invite God to speak to us, when we hear his voice, he will continue to speak and he will give us clarity. And the example of this is, is so Saul says, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, 
I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And Ananias says, Yes, Lord, he replied. And the Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Both cases, super specific instructions because they were willing to invite God to speak. I think often when we think of prayer, um, you know, we sometimes get, we sometimes understand that um, prayer isn't just us talking to God, right? Like that's, I think, that that's a really good first step in understanding prayer. And then I think a second step, and honestly, this is probably where I'm at right now even, is then we listen, right? So we pray, and then we get to a point where we listen. The simple church I was in um, in the winter um, was really cool because what we would do is we would pick a, a piece of scripture, um, we would read it, we'd sort of talk about it, and then we'd spend five minutes in silence just thinking about it and reading it and then we would talk about that and then we would spend 10 minutes every simple church just in complete silence just listening just having no agenda for the prayer having no agenda for what we were going to share after we didn't even actually talk about what we um, heard or what we were led to pray during that time of silence Um, we just sat and listened for God's voice and it was so cool and it was so refreshing Um, But there's even one more step to that. So that's something I experienced in the winter. And then there's one more step, and that's actually responding, right? Prayer is a conversation. It's not just us talking and then listening and then going on our way. It's responding to God, talking to God, asking God questions. And we see this further. Um, When Ananias hears what he's supposed to do, he goes, but Lord... (laughs) I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. So Ananias was a believer in Damascus, and Paul had letters from the leaders of the Jewish religion that he was allowed to arrest anyone who called on the name of Jesus. So if Ananias was to go and pray for him, he'd be like, hi, you can arrest me, right? That's essentially what Ananias is saying. He's going, God, like, what? What? This guy's really dangerous, and and he's been persecuting your church. Um, And what this shows me is that, well, God's response is great. He doesn't get mad at Ananias. He doesn't say, why aren't you just, I told you what to do, just go. Why are you questioning me? He gives him further instruction. He leads him further. He takes his hand. He gives him further instruction. I find that so freeing because often when I, I think honestly, I fear that God's going to be mad at me if I'm, hesitant to do something I feel like he's asking me to do or if I if I'm honest that like oh I really don't want to do that God um you know that he'll be like mad and angry and that's not the case at all um I mean he's firm he says he says go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake Essentially, God's telling Ananias in this section, like, you actually don't have to worry about Saul. Like, let me worry about Saul. I'm going to show him how much he has to suffer for my name. You just need to go pray for him. The guy can't see. Also, he's seen a vision of you coming to heal him, so you better go, because otherwise that's going to be confusing. (laughs) Um, Right? Um, And this is really where the rubber hits the road, right? This This is the acting on God's voice. Ananias has a choice. He doesn't have to go. We have free will, right? Like, God's pretty firm. He's saying, go. I have got big plans for this guy. Please help me. Um, but Ananias has to, has to process through that and obey the voice of God and act on the voice of God, right? Um, it requires a step of faith. And I think the interesting thing about obedience, and again, um, you know, I share this with you guys as someone who's literally walking, walking this path with you. This, this sermon is as much to me as it is to you guys. But obedience isn't a moment. Um, it's not this black and white, you know, hammer obey. It's this series of moments where we 
converse with God, we come to an understanding and into a partnership with him. Because the reality is, a lot of times, our soul or our emotions and our mind and our will are not in line with what God's will is, right? God's will is perfect and it's pure, and oftentimes we are not. Um, And so we need to sort of process through the tension of that to get to a place where we are in willful partnership with God. And willful partnership with God doesn't always mean that it's going to feel light and airy and peaceful. It might be hard. It may, you know, it may be tearful obedience to Christ, right? Um, but, I mean, that's, that's the life of, of a Christian. Take up your cross and follow me. Are you willing to follow me? Are you willing to lay down your life? Um, And so I just want to encourage you that this obedience is really a process. And we actually, I was reading, um, I was actually in in a book I'm reading just for my, like, personal devotions. Um, It's funny how God sort of (laughs) helps you along the way. It's like, oh, look, you can put this in your sermon. Um, (laughs) Thank you. Um, (coughs) The author pointed out that Jesus actually had this exact experience in John 12, Um, there's a couple of people who want to come and talk to Jesus, and he ends up predicting his death. But right after that happens, he goes, my my soul is troubled. Um, And we know that in the following days, Jesus spends a lot of time in agonizing prayer, saying, God, if there's another way, you know, let this cup pass from me, is the words he uses. Um, and, And then he comes into um, alignment with the Father, and he he dies on the cross so that we have the privilege of being in relationship with him. Um, and, and so that's just an encouragement that, that Jesus felt the tension too. Um, and when you feel that tension, um, be encouraged that you can ask God questions. You can process through it with him. You can ask, is there another way? Do I, do I really have to invite that person to church? <laughs> Like, can I just take them for coffee and ask how they're doing? Can I do that, God, instead? And, and uh, no? Oh, okay. And then you'll come to a resolution, right? It's not easy, but there's room to talk. And that's really what the act, acting on God's voice is. It's, it's, it's being willing to continue the conversation. Um, and we see, we'll see what happens when Ananias was willing to continue the conversation and to walk in obedience. Um, let me just see where I am here. Yeah, we're talking about Ananias. So he decides to go and talk to Saul. But what I wonder is when I read the scripture, we know that Saul, it says that. Uh, His companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. So we know Saul was in Damascus blind for three days before Ananias came and healed him. What we don't know is whether or not Ananias went the second God told him to go. What we don't know is on what day God talked to him. And to me, this is interesting because it speaks to this whole thing of tension and processing. And it gives me a bit of, it makes me feel a bit of grace because Ananias could have heard God's voice on on day one of Saul being blind, right? God says, he is praying to me right now, and he's seeing this vision of you coming and healing him from his blindness. Um, And Ananias went, "Uh, excuse me, this guy is a murderer. Um, And, you know, I wonder, did Ananias sort of wrestle with God for a day and then on the third day go? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's just a fun question to ask. Ask scripture questions. Um, it can lead to all sorts of discoveries about who Jesus is and how he works and um, how we can um, grow our relationship with him. But that's just something I, I thought of, you know, did Ananias live in that tension for a couple of days while he conversed with God? The scripture seems to imply that he actually, he actually went right away because it, it says then, and so Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. So there's a lot of cool things happening here. First of all, 
Ananias somehow knows the exact details of Saul's encounter with Jesus on the road, but he wasn't there, right? So God must have given him a word of knowledge to let Saul know. The second thing is that his Ananias going to heal Saul, and I've mentioned this, is an exact confirmation of Saul's vision, um, right? The scripture says um, he's praying, and um, what does it say? He's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision where a man named Ananias comes in laying his hands on him so he can see again. Um, this might sound outlandish, but if you guys were here two weeks ago, you would have heard Claire Bradley share a story about a young woman getting into a taxi, and um, she just she started praying. I think she felt a bit maybe uncomfortable being alone in, in the taxi, and she felt the Lord sort of encourage her to tell the taxi driver that Jesus loved him, and she, and she was she was in um, a predominantly Muslim co country, so she felt probably a bit unsafe and unsure of how that would go over, right? So she was like, okay, Lord, are you sure? Okay, I'm going to get my money ready. I'm going to tell him right when I get out of the taxi. I'm going to, like, hand him my money, say, Jesus loves you, and get out of the taxi. Um, there. That, that's my deal with you, God. And so that's exactly what she did. She said, Jesus loves you, hands him the money, and gets out of the taxi. And he says, wait, come back. What did you say? And, and she's like, um, I said, Jesus loves you. And he said, I've been having dreams all week. And my la dream last night was that a young woman got into my taxi. And at the very end, she handed me my money and, says, Je and said, Jesus loves me. Right? Is that not exactly what happened in Acts? Very cool, right? This isn't super outlandish stuff. This is what happens when we act on the voice of God in our life. Um, and so the third thing that happens in this last section, Saul gets baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And so now Saul gets to go out and proclaim the word of Christ to other people. And the next time Christ speaks to Saul, instead of having to go through the process of saying, yes, uh, who are you, Lord? He gets to say, yes, Lord, and act in obedience to Christ right away. And this is really where it all comes together because Saul does just that. He gets baptized and right away starts preaching in Damascus. And he stays in Damascus for three years and he preaches. And then there's a, a plot on his life to, to kill him. So the believers um, sort of sneak him out of the city. And then he goes to Jerusalem and he gets discipled by the apostles there. And then there's another plot in his life. So then they send him home to Tarsus. And then we get to... The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. We can't act on the voice of God um, unless we know what the voice of God is. And so my encouragement to you, because it can be an intimidating thing to do, God can ask you to do things that are outside of your comfort zone, but, and that can be really draining if we're not constantly in conversation with him, because if we don't know the voice of the Holy Spirit, we can't be encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, and that's exactly what scripture says, this is like a formula for kingdom growth, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, or sorry, the believers lived in fear of the Lord, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. And so what I just wanted to share with you tonight was that when we act on the voice of God, we learn obedience, which leads to an increase in our ministry. And when I say ministry, that can be anything, whatever you're called to. It doesn't have to be Robin up here leading this church. Um, while this church is his ministry, you know, I... I don't work for the church. I work, well, right now I'm raising my daughter. I'm on maternity leave, but I work outside the church. And I feel very strongly that that is my ministry. And so I need to lean into the Holy Spirit and to act on his voice so that I can increase my ministry. You know, maybe it means inviting um, a coworker to church, which is, can be an intimidating thing in, in our Canadian culture. Um, Robin, just this week after I was sort of sharing notes with him about my sermon, when I, when I said, you know, I think we know the voice of God a lot more than, than we let ourselves believe. You know, often, often we're like, man, that was crazy pizza I ate last night. Like, you know, <laughs> or like, 
<laughs> or or we or we go to someone until they confirm our our lame excuse like oh Robin's not listening to me I'm gonna go to Philly right like <laughs> so but but when we just sit and we say Lord are you speaking to me or yes Lord I'm here I'm listening I'm willing it invites him to help us along the way um, and so I just want to encourage you guys to listen for the voice of God don't explain it away instead of internalizing and processing whether or not it's God's voice with yourself why don't you just ask him what would happen if we all just said yes Lord right I mean a small example is inviting someone to church I'm pretty sure you don't need to ask God if he's asking you to invite someone to church like just invite them to church right <laughs> like or or if they or if you're like hmm, maybe I should tell that person Jesus loves them like that's you should probably just do that anyways right um so this is a process, um, and it's not easy, but be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Learn to hear his voice. Learn to hear his encouragement, and I know sometimes you're like, this is great, Lord, but I don't really know how to hear the voice of God, so how am I supposed to act on the voice of God if I can't hear the voice of God, and that's this vicious cycle. There's a few things, a few practical things I'm going to leave you with. The voice of God, <clears throat> if you hear something and it's um, shameful, degrading, uh, aggressive, bullying, fearful, that's not um, guilt tripping, not the voice of God. If you hear something that's loving, encouraging, uplifting, um, pure, uh, not self-serving, um, that is the voice of God. Um, so just start there, right? If you feel yourself beating yourself up because, oh, I didn't obey and I'm the worst and God's so mad at me, not the voice of God, right? God's voice is, it's okay, let's try again. You know, I will give you more opportunity. I have more grace. Um, so that's where you can start. But what I really wanted to point out was what happens when we act on that voice and not to be afraid to just act and not... Don't explain away the encouragement you feel from the Holy Spirit. And so tonight, just as a way of response, um, you guys can close your eyes if you want to. Um, if you want to have boldness to say, yes, Lord, when you feel encouragement to either to step out in faith from the Holy Spirit, I'd just love for you to raise your hand. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for boldness for you. Awesome. That's great. And if you're someone who who doesn't know Christ, um, but maybe feels like he's calling to you um, and you want to step into relationship with him, um, I just want to invite you and give you an opportunity to say, yes, Lord, for the first time and come into relationship with him so that, so that you can know the voice of God. And so if that's you, you can just raise your, your hand quickly. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I'm going to pray. God, I just thank you for this time. I thank you that your word speaks clearly about how you want to be in relationship with us and that it doesn't matter, God, that if, if we know you yet or not, but you desire to speak to us. Um, so, God, I just pray for clarity for everyone in this room and for boldness for everyone in this room, especially those who, who raise their hands, God, that they would have the boldness to say, yes, Lord, when they hear your voice and that they would have the boldness to act in faith. And God, that I would have the boldness to act in faith when I hear your voice in my life. And so, God, I just pray that you would bless the rest of our time together, um, that we would leave here feeling um, equipped to go out and live in in relationship with you and be encouraged by your holy spirit and god to grow your kingdom in jesus name i pray amen